Well, friends, we'll be walking through this third portion of the sixth chapter of the 1689, and specifically we'll be dealing with the last two paragraphs, paragraph four and five of the sixth chapter of the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. And the two topics that we're dealing with in these last two paragraphs are first, original sin and its fruits, and secondly, sin in the life of the believer. And though these topics in and of themselves aren't joyful, these topics do remind us of the grace that has been shown to us through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the fourth paragraph of the, of the sixth chapter of the confession. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. And there's four descriptors that the framers use within this paragraph to talk about original sin. They say utterly disposed, disabled, opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to evil. These are the consequences of all who were born in Adam on account of the sin they inherited from Adam. And the immediate kickback to such language is, is to say, is it, is it really that bad? Is it really that serious? Do you have to be so negative uh, to, to just say that people are absolutely no good? Uh, they're utterly indisposed. They're opposite of good. They're always inclined toward evil. And we see some of this even in Romans 8, 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit, its, submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so the key here is not to use a manly, a worldly standard of goodness or a worldly standard of of righteousness, remembering that this is not saying that people are as bad as they possibly can be, but it's saying but that by the standard of God's law, using the standard of God's law, that we are unable to keep it. We have no desire to keep it. Even our religious activities that we're doing in the flesh are done in a way that is not consistent with what the law of God actually requires. The question is, by what standard that question must be asked. And by God's righteous standard, it is insufficient. That is why we need Christ. That's why we need the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jim Renahan makes this point. He says, good here must refer in the context of the confession as a whole to that which God himself approves and calls good. All right? As it says in chapter 16, good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word. God is the standard of this goodness. God is the standard of righteousness. That's the standard we must look to. Renahan continues, he says, the indisposition, inability, and opposite to good find their complement in an unmitigated inclination toward evil. The results of the fall for Adam's progeny are dreadful. Not only do we inherit depravity, not only are we separated from all good, but we give ourselves freely and willingly, it becomes our pursuit. It's the natural inclination, it is the desire of what people do. There must be a change. The change must come from the outside. This world will tell you that your greatest problems are on the outside and the solution to those problems are on the inside. But the reality is your greatest problem is on the inside of you and the solution is on the outside of you. Paul says this in Colossians 1, 21 and 22. He says, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You're holy, blameless, and above reproach according to God's standard. That high standard that I said that we are all born, as I said in a couple slides earlier, indisposed, disabled, opposite to good, holy, inclined to evil. In Christ Jesus, you meet that standard. You sufficiently meet that standard in Christ because of who he is and what he has done. Christ is that Standard, And so it is not us at any point looking in the mirror to determine, am I good enough? 
Am I righteous enough to please God? Am I sufficient enough? You never, you don't need to do that. You can look to God's law in a desire to walk in obedience to God out of a grateful heart. But you're not looking to find a standard of righteousness whereby you sufficiently meet that standard to please God. That comes through Christ and through Christ alone. The problem is deep, deep within us and the solution is outside of us in Christ. God must act upon us. We must trust in Christ. We must be saved. Jesus talks about the depth of this problem in Matthew 15, 19 through 20. He says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. You see within this passage the distinction between true religion and false religion. Man's religion in God's religion. They are not the same thing. They are, they are different. And true religion deals with what is inside of a person. Man's religion primarily deals with what is on the outside. Man believes that he is in increasing the standard and its requirement through emphasizing these outward rules and these laws. But God is dealing with the inside of the person. Um, but that's not the end all and end be all. That, praise be to God. I mean, we've walked through original sin in the last couple of the uh, sessions on, the, on this chapter of the 1689. This isn't the end all and, and the be all. Uh, Christ um, works in the life of the believer to affect them and to change them. But the reality is there's still effects of sin. We, this side of glory, we will not be perfect. We will not experience perfection. That is something that comes in glory. That is something that comes in the final state, in, in glorification. Let's read this paragraph and then we'll, we'll review um, the fourfold state of man. But paragraph 5 of chapter 6 says, The corruption of nature during this life does remain in those that are regenerate, and although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and the first motions thereof are truly and properly sin. We're going to focus on this f line we have here, um, first motions thereof. But first I want to just give a reminder here, um, the sin in the life of the believer, that we must see and understand and remember that there are four states that humanity has existed in, or ultimately will exist in, we could say that as well. Um, the first is a state of innocence. When God made Adam and Eve, they were born not, they weren't born, they were created, right? They were, they were righteous. They were completely righteous. Uh, they weren't sinful. Now, they did have the ability to, to change in their nature. They had the ability to sin or to walk in righteousness. They were not born like we are born. Um, there is a heresy that exists known as Pelagianism. Pelagianism will tell you that we are born in the same state as Adam and Eve. The same disposition of, as Adam and Eve. It's just our environment that really, really affects us. But that's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures talk about the fact that the human heart is desperately wicked. The human heart is, is evil. And it's not talking about the human heart in the way that God created man, but the way in which man is born in Adam and affected by Adam's sin. Adam and Eve were born in this state of innocence and it resulted in themselves and all who came after them being in a state of sin affected by the sin of Adam, born in this original sin. And they go from being in a state in Adam where they could do good or not do good, okay? Walk in righteousness or sin to being in a state where they can only sin. They have no ability to do that which is righteous. Again, emphasizing this doesn't mean that people are as bad as they possibly can be. I've said it many times over, the most evil person that you can imagine or think of in all of history could have been worse than they are. Okay, you can even find some level of decency and some level of, by a worldly standard, goodness in some of the most evil people that have ever existed. But not by God's standard can you find righteousness in anyone who is in the flesh. Anyone who has their mind set on the flesh, as Paul said earlier, he says they cannot please God, meaning they cannot keep God's law. 
And so man must change from being in a state of sin to being in a state of grace. And that happens through the work of God regenerating that person, giving them eyes to see and to trust upon the glorious gospel of Christ Jesus. The only means that God has given whereby anyone can be stay, saved. And, and in that state of grace, as you walk and experience that grace, you have the ability to walk in righteousness or to sin. Th those are both options. All of you are well aware of this, um, that you can sin or you can walk in righteousness. You have that ability at that point to keep God's law from the heart with right intentions, with, with right desires. But the reality is, this is what they're emphasizing in this last paragraph of chapter 6, and that is that there's still a corruption of nature. There's still an effect upon you from sin. Some people will teach wrongly that Christians won't sin. They will teach that uh, Christians can um, come to a state of perfection. I debated a bishop in the Methodist church on this topic of perfectionism. And this man, now he did not claim that he was perfect, because that might have made the debate a little bit easier, but he just came, claimed that theoretically you could become perfect. And he would make these arguments and say, well, what's the point of it all if you can't ever make it? If you can't ever reach it, what's the point of it all? That's an incredible thing to look at the glorious gospel, to look at the work of Christ and say, ah, what's, what's the point of it all, actually? But that was the argument that he was, he was making. But here's what happens. When man either tries to say that unregenerate man can keep the law in some way, or man tries to say that you can be perfect this side of glory, he has to make an adjustment to the law of God. He has to change the law of God. He has to make it so that it's not this standard of righteousness that the Lord declares to be righteous, but it's rather this lower standard here. And then he will say, but we did it. Look at me. I'm looking in the mirror and I can see where I kept this standard. I checked off this box. It is, it is legalism. And it is a lowering of the law of God. When you see the ways in which you don't keep God's law, it should drive you to the cross. We must look to the cross and not to the mirror. It's not about us. It's not about our standard of righteousness. It's not about us reaching a state of perfection. We, we do not do that, the side of glory. And within this debate, what he did was the first thing that he did was to make an adjustment to the law of God. And he said, look, I'm not saying that anyone in this life perfectly keeps God's law the way that we see it declared by Jesus, right? Every, every word, thought, and deed, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he says, I'm just saying that you can do it outwardly. You can get to a point where outwardly you do these things, but there's still maybe secret sins you don't know about. You, that you can get to a place where you never intentionally sin against God. Now, it is true that to intentionally, willfully sin against God is something that is worse than an unintentional sin. You see that within the ceremonial law. Uh, we see that within our own legal system here as well. There is a difference between murder and manslaughter, the one being intentional, the one being unintentional, the one rather being perhaps careless in, in one's behavior. So we understand that it's worse to do something intentionally, but this standard of unintentional sin at no point ever in the scriptures is declared to be perfection. It's always off from the market. It's so far from perfection that we need not even, even mention it. It would be like, in my estimation, that you were in a, a, a gymnasium, all right, and you were, you were shooting an arrow at a target, and you shot that arrow, all right, in the opposite direction of the target, and it hit the wall behind you, and you said, well, hey, it, at least it's, it didn't go out the window. At least it's in the room. I mean, anyone who's involved in archery would say that's ridiculous. Why would you say that hit the mark? You didn't even come close to the target. You're, you're completely the other direction. We say, yeah, but at least I'm in the room. That's a standard that you made up. 
That's not a standard that in any way aligns with the rules, the terms of archery. It in no way lines up with how you would generally understand to be making a mark, much less a, a perfect strike in the center of that target. Absolutely not. I believe that's what we're doing when we try to say that you can be perfect in your outward deeds, but, but maybe not with your thoughts or your desires or your intentions. The reality is your desires affect whether something is righteous or not. Your desires affect whether something is righteous or not. Imagine someone, and I've used this illustration before, but I think it works really well because it's one that you can relate to. Imagine someone came to you and they said, hey, here's $500. I want you to have this $500 here. Please take it. You might say, that's a, that's a nice thing. What a nice man. He just gave me $500. I'm so grateful that you just gave me $500. Dollars, and then you realize that he was really just trying to bribe you. He was really just trying to, to distract you so he could pull something over on you. H how many of you have uh, ever, I don't this has happened to me a few times, maybe these aren't as big as they used to be, that you would have somebody, and I'm not bashing anyone if you're doing one of these things, I'm not preaching against these in all ways, but there is a tendency amongst these groups sometimes to do this. And so if the shoe fits, you're welcome to wear it. And uh, you can, you can charge, me, charge me for this if you want. But I have known friends that have gotten involved in some of these uh, mar multi-level marketing type schemes. And the way these many times work is, um, again, don't take offense on this. This isn't directed at anyone in this room. I don't know what any of you are involved in. But, but sometimes these generally work to make sales within your own network. And so you will use, uh, you know, kind of the, the friendships that you have, the networks that you have to try to sell to some of those people. And I think that's totally, totally reasonable to sell things to people that you know, especially if you're selling something that that person might be interested in. Certainly you want to work with someone that you know. But here's what will happen sometimes. And, and this is the part where where for me, it's, it's, it's kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, someone said, hey, would you like to come out to eat with me? Or would you like to come over to my house? Or once I even had someone call me on the phone that I hadn't talked to in a while. And he's like, hey, how are you doing? I just, I just wanted to check on you, see how you're doing. How's going? How's school going? How's work going? How's the family doing? We're talking through this. And you know, this guy had a strong personality and I hadn't talked to him in a while. And I was really happy to talk to him. And he said, well, hey, since I got you on the phone, you know where this is going, don't you? Since I got you on the phone, I've got some guys in another line. And I was just telling you about this, this great scheme that I've been involved in. And I'm making so much money. There's someone else over here that, that has, is making so much money. And, and he drives a, uh, he drove some Corvette or, or he drove some car. Uh, someone's always driving a car or going on a vacation. Or, or they have some kind of a house that, that's, that's being communicated to you in these schemes. And he's like, oh, let me just, and then he, he brought me into this. Um, we don't really do these anymore. Now it would be a Zoom meeting. But at the time, it would be like this uh, a call with like 30 people on it. And this guy came on talking about this great scheme that he had where you were going to basically sell people things they could buy at Walmart. And they just need, I needed to begin with like a $1,000 investment. And I can tell you the way I felt at that point was at first I was really happy that this person called me and reached out to me and talked to me. There's times where someone says, hey, you want to meet me at this restaurant? I'm like, hey, I'd like to go hang out with some people. And then I realized, like, you're just trying to sell me something. You're just trying to get me to make this investment. You're just trying to get me to be your right leg over here so that you can get me to go find some other people. I, I would have appreciated if you would have said, hey, there's this adventure that I have. Maybe you might be interested. Would you like to join me uh, at the restaurant or at my house? And then I could know what was going on instead of it, it being changed. And you see, like, it's the same action. Someone calling me on the phone, someone inviting me to a restaurant, someone inviting me to their house. But then I realize, or at least I perceive, uh, you weren't really interested in me as a person. You were interested in uh, maybe some money that you, you thought that I had that you may soon realize that I didn't have to invest in your, your little scheme. And my point there is that you can't say that merely outward actions can reach perfection because your intention matters. Your intention matters. Your intention affects it. If someone's trying to bribe you, that outward action is insufficient. Their intention does matter, and our legal system even recognizes that. 
Renahan makes this point in his book. This is a, it comes out of a commentary that he gave on the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Excellent work. It's basically his magnum opus, life's work. It says, paragraph 3 ended with the hopeful words about the gospel. Paragraph 5 assumes the truth stated there and anticipates the gracious acts of God in the lives of men and women. When we are seeing this lowness, all right, the depth from which we are pulled, the seriousness of our sin, when we're seeing even the sin in our own lives, it must drive us to the cross. It must drive us to Christ. It must remind us of the grace that has been shown to us. That alienation is gone in Christ Jesus. That unrighteousness is gone in Christ Jesus. Um, but there's still this struggle with sin. Uh, there's probably no better place to look in the scriptures than Romans 7. We could probably spend the whole time just walking through Romans 7. There's no better place to see the believer struggling with sin. Uh, Romans 7, 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have a desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. There's still the effects of sin within the life of the believer. And, and seeing that sin must drive you to the cross. It must drive you to a gratefulness to Christ. It must drive you toward a yearning and a desire for the glorification that all who are in Christ will receive. Renahan says this, regeneration imparts new life, but the believer groans waiting for the day of full redemption when body and soul are united in God's presence forever. In this life, sin will continue to manifest its presence. God's spirit is at work in every believer even while their sin remains. Continuing Romans 7, 23. But I see that my members, that in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells within my members. Again, this idea of um, the fight that the believer continues to have with sin. Another reason to emphasize the fact that merely outward action can't be declared to be perfection is in these, this line here at the very end, yet both itself and the first motions thereof truly and properly sin. It's dealing with this idea that even coming from the desire, that's where sin begins, and that sinful desire is sinful. There are some that are debating this right now. Is, is, it, is, it, is it possible to have unrighteous desires and them not be sinful? Is it, is it possible to have, the debate right now is, is going on the topic of homosexuality. Can I have, can someone have a homosexual desire and it not be sinful? Well, no, that's, that is a sinful desire. That is something that is, that is wrong. That is a desire that Jesus would not have had. That is not God's desire for um, the way, for what you would desire, but there's grace in Christ Jesus, is it worse if you act on the desire? Absolutely. It's much worse if you act on a sinful desire, but the desire itself, from a biblical understanding, is sinful. Let me, let me try to make this argument. Um, it's definitely within the confession, because you see that right here within this, within this line. Renahan says this, this statement is intended. They were intentional in putting this here, because the Socinians, Romanists, that's the... Um, um, Roman Catholics, Arminians, uh, in that they teach that concupiscence or lust and the first motives thereof which have not gotten consent of the will are not properly and truly sin. The Reformed doctrine asserts that all sin is sin and in need of cleansing and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. One of the things that the Lord does in your sanctification is he renews your mind. He works within your heart. How many of you, when you became a Christian, had certain desires that you don't have them in the same way at this time? I'm not saying everything is, is changed and removed, but, but one of the things that the Lord is doing within the life of the believer, which does affect the action of the believer, is to work within the heart of the believer, the mind of the believer, to renew the mind of the believer, that there would be true and actual change from within the believer. If this isn't sinful, if this isn't wrong, why, why would Jesus change this within you? Well, he changes this within you because he loves you and he cares for you and he desires what is best for you. In desiring what is best for yourself, 
is what is best for you. That is a, that is a good thing. The sinful desires must be dealt with. This idea of first motions, here's an example in, in Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, I don't know if this is helpful for some of you or not, but this is a, a term that um, existed in this time period. Uh, Act 2, scene 1 of Julius Caesar, uh, Brutus is contemplating the murder that he will commit. All right, you remember? Uh, et tu Brute? Uh, how many of you had to, had to read this in high school? I had to, I had to memorize uh, Mark Anthony's speech and recite it. Um, it says, okay, since Cassius did, did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept between the acting of and a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or hideous dream, the genius and the mortal instruments are in council and the state of man like to a little kingdom suffers then the nature of an insurrection. Okay, I could have probably read that with a little better Shakespearean accent. But the idea here is that Brutus, and honestly, Shakespeare does a really good job of dealing with these, this inner turmoil and thoughts that people have. And if you read uh, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, and, and, and her struggles uh, that, that she walked through. Um, but these he deals with these, these inner emotions, this turmoil that Brutus is going through, that he has a desire to put his friend to death. He has a desire to take the life of Julius Caesar um, through this conspiracy and, and taking his life. And it's a desire that they would attain this power. And he's dealing with it. He's fighting with this. Now you tell me this. Would, would you, you, someone wants to say that, well, the, the, the thing that is unpopular right now in Christianity is the view on homosexuality. And so there's this tendency at the motion to say, at the moment to say, well, those first motions aren't sinful, those desires aren't sinful. Who is gonna stand up and say, murderous desires are not sinful? Who wants to go and, and move from the seventh commandment to the sixth commandment and begin to say that these, these, these sinful desires of murdering someone are not sinful. They absolutely are. I don't think anyone's going to try to make that argument there. Um, Shakespeare, I don't know that he was a Christian, but he understood this idea very well. And in literature, you do have these, um, these struggles of the characters where they're dealing with these first motions. We know that these things are wrong. And this is one of the ways that you have victory over sin is by seeing these sinful desires, recognizing that they are wrong and, and turning from them, turning to Christ, trusting in Christ Jesus, that Christ is sufficient. Right, not this worldly desire, not this lustful desire. No, Christ is, Christ is sufficient. I think we see this in James, James 1 and 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown uh, brings forth, I think it ends with death and I did not I did not put it on there. I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. Francis Churchill says this, do not cease um, uh, talking about um, these motions. They do not cease to be sins although they are neither wholly voluntary nor in our power. He's dealing with the reality that that these things come into your mind and you didn't intentionally put them there. We're, we're, we're affected by sin. Okay, becoming a Christian doesn't end this. Okay, it's the beginning of the fight. It's the beginning of the fight because the reality is before that, you weren't really fighting it. You say, well, I'm struggling with sin, Pastor. I'm struggling with sin. That's, a, that's good. That's, it's not good. It's not good that you have sin in your life, but it's good that you're struggling. That's, that's the good part. Because before you weren't struggling, maybe you were kicking at the consequences of your sin. All right, maybe you had an, you know, a worldly grief for sin and it was merely a grief for its consequences, merely a grief for the ways in which it affected you and the people that you love. But that's not a, that's not a godly grief. That's a worldly grief in that situation. Um, the fact is, these must be affected, these must be changed. And this also brings us to this question. What well, was Jesus tempted? This has been a question that's been asked for, for some time. Was Jesus tempted in the garden by the devil? You say, well, I can read the, 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 the Bible. It says the devil tempted him. 
Okay, the devil tempted him. I would say the devil attempted to tempt him. Because if we're looking at, at James here, and, and we're understanding what this is talking about, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. That's what you did not have in Christ. You did not have these ungodly desires. You did not have these desires to go around the law of God. You had a desire to walk in righteousness. And it is out of that that the fruits of obedience work themselves in what he said and in what he did. Satan attempted to tempt him, but within, within his heart, within his mind, he was not moved. The, there were, he did not have those movings towards sinful desire. He did not have what we have here laid out at the end of this paragraph, those first motions. That's the temptation that we're dealing with there, where someone is, is looking upon something that is sinful and looking at it as though it is a solution to a perceived problem that they have in their life. Sin is never a solution to your problems in your life. It, you will tell yourself that. That's, you go back to the very beginning of the scriptures. That is the lie that Satan is telling. Um, but Jesus did not have those first motions. Um, again, just emphasize perfectionism. We, we must not, we must not be frustrated in a way in which we have, have no hope regarding a struggle with sin. You will not be perfect this side of glory. That's not a failure on the part of God. You must look from where you came. You must see where the Lord has placed you now. You must not be like the man that I debated that said, well, what's the point? What's the point? Are you kidding me? Do, do you know where I was before the Lord came into my life? Do you know where I was before I was regenerated? Do you know where I was apart from a renewed mind? The wrath of God was over me. I was on my way to hell. I, I, was, I was pulled up from the depths of the, the mire and the muck of sinfulness. I was given the righteousness of Christ, imputed to me. And the same for you. And then to say, well, what does it all matter? Are you kidding me? It matters a great deal. It is, it is very significant. And the fact that the Lord is working within you and sanctifying you immediately, yes, and progressively, is not that we must look and say, but why didn't you do this? You can do that with a great many things in life. A great many things. You can see something good someone does over here. You can, how many, how many of you have had friends where you're like, hey, you know, this is, this is so great. This, this person was, was saved, praise God. This person was cured of cancer or whatever. And they say, well, yeah, but this person over here wasn't. That's not really the point of what I was trying to say. I was grateful for what was happening here. I can't then go over here and say, but what about, why didn't you do this too? What an ungrateful heart. And then to say, to look at the glorious gospel and all it's done in the life of the person and then to say, but why isn't he perfect right now? It's, it's not, you're not in glory yet. There's a great many reasons why he hasn't made everything exactly perfect at this point. And one of them is communicated in the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, that there's a reason why. Why doesn't God just get rid of all of this sin? Why doesn't God just get rid of all these evil people? Well, you're still here. Do you want him to remove you? Should he start with you? It's funny, even people, slightly off topic, but not totally. It's similar to that. So those that will want to talk about population control, and there's too many people in this world, and they, we just need to get rid of all these people, and they never start with themselves and their own family. Maybe you can find someone that did. You don't need to send that to me. I'm, I'm sure there's a sick person that did. But, but my point is, for the most part, it's, it's all these other people out here. When people talk about all this evil in the world that they need to get rid of. Why doesn't God do this? Well, well, he is. He's sanctifying his people. That is the process that he's using in removing sin from this world. He's, he's saving people. He's sanctifying them. He's ultimately going to glorify them. And he has a purpose even in their sinful actions now. There was a purpose in the sinful actions of those that put Jesus upon the cross. That's how sovereign God is. That's how powerful he is. He uses even the sinful, willful actions of men to accomplish his purpose. Men willfully and sinfully put Christ upon the cross. And that is the means through which he saved his people. The brothers of Joseph willfully and, sinful, and sinfully sold their brother into slavery. And he used that. 
He used that to save even those brothers from starvation. That is the power of God. So we must not look at sin in our lives and say, you know, why didn't God just do something about this? He he is. He's bringing it to your attention. So that's the first step in, in dealing with it. Ecclesiastes emphasizes this, that no one is righteous. Surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Uh, 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. Uh, we do not reach the state of sinless perfection, but we will be glorified one day. Um, Paul unpacking this in Romans 7 Uh, I've read some of these before. I'll read them again. But I see my members, um, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, he doesn't doesn't stay there. See that? He doesn't see the sin in his life. He grieves over the sin in his life, but, but he doesn't stay there. He doesn't say, woe is me. He doesn't say, oh, I'm hopeless. Oh, God, why didn't you do a better job, God? Or why have you left all these evil people in the world? Or why haven't you fully sanctified me at this point? No, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And he's dealing here, he's communicating in these words, this tension that exists between the flesh and, and the spirit. Um, and we end here with this, with this end in Romans, Romans 3, which fully emphasizes the, the depth of, of sin, the fullness, the seriousness of sin, the ways in which it's affected all people, all ethnicities are affected. Romans 3, 9 through 19, what then, are Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood in the paths of ruin and misery. In the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Now we know that what the law says, it speaks to those that are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world might be held accountable to God. And you get to the end of this and you see the hopelessness of man in his natural state. You see the hopelessness of man in sin. And you see the only hope that God has given and that is Christ Jesus. It is all about Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you see your sin and you turn to him. As a Christian, even with the sin in your life, it is still all about Jesus. It's not about your contriving, your manufacturing righteousness. It's not about you just changing your environment, though you may need to change your environment to some degrees. You may realize I need to not hang out with this person. You may say I may need to not be in this particular place at this particular time. That's acceptable, but that's not the be all and the end all. There's Christ is the one to whom we must be going, not merely a change of environment. Christ is the one to whom we must go, not merely uh, a, a gaining of a particular knowledge in some way. Other well, knowledge is a part of this. It is to Christ that you must go. It's to the cross that you must go, dear believer, when you see sin in your life, not to the mirror. Not to the mirror. You may, you may look to the mirror to see where you have come from, how God has changed you. You may look to the mirror of the law and see where you err and how you should change and with a righteous desire, with a thankful heart, walk in obedience to God's law. But not for the looking to see that you're making that standard whereby you are attaining this righteous standing. Your righteous standing comes through Christ. It came through Christ. It continues to be in Christ. Your standing with God is not a roller coaster up and down depending on how you feel this day your standing in Christ is consistent and continual because it's not based upon us it's based upon Christ and what he has done Christ is the object of our faith because Christ is the only means this God has given whereby you can be saved it's the only means that God has given whereby you can have peace with God it is in Christ It was in Christ when you became a Christian. It is in Christ as you've been a Christian 20 years. And it will be in Christ in glory a million years into the future in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Christ and the blessing that he has given to us. The fullness of what he has accomplished. 
We thank you that Christ is sufficient, that we need not lean on ourselves or our own understanding. We need not lean upon our goodness or our sufficiency. That Christ has given us all that is necessary for life and growth and godliness. I pray this in the name of our blessed Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.